straight to it. I've GPSed it and we should back off because I don't want to scare her. And we'll let her settle down and then once she's gotten a few eggs in there she'll feel a lot more secure and then we can do more at the nest. <laughs> We're out looking for Lapland longspur nests. It's one of two species we follow up here on the tundra. And today we'll be just looking for male and female pairs, We're trying to find them by song or sight, and then hopefully identifying nest locations. Females are just in the process of nest building, so we're looking for females picking up grass or moss or even feathers, which they'll use to build their nests and then following them as they carry that to the nest site. So most of these Laplands come back to the same general area. They may not nest in the same exact location, but they are pretty sight faithful. She's got a feather. We just found a Lapland longspur nest, so the female flew over with a, what looked like a ptarmigan feather, and basically just got a general location on where she came out of. So normally when they visit the nest, they fly away rather quickly. So you just want to focus on where you first see her fly from, and then just go investigate that area. In this case, we got lucky and were able to find the nest. So it's actually right here. And they line, line it with ptarmigan feathers so you can kind of see a white flash through the vegetation. So now we're just gonna mark the nest with a tongue depressor and some flagging strips that are gonna be five and 10 meters from the nest. Yeah, I did. And we'll GPS this point. All right, let's get out of here. Since the 50s, there's been huge increases in, in shrub cover on the North Slope. So this is creating new habitat for shrub breeding birds and potentially reducing breeding habitat for open tundra breeding birds. We're using the white crowned sparrow as our model organism for a shrub nester and we're using the lap and long spur as our model organism for our open tundra breeding bird. What we're doing is looking for nests in the Arctic so we can quantify reproductive success for those two species. How many offspring do they fledge a year? How many nests on average get predated? Some of the newer things that have come out of this is we've been working up at mile point 386, which is the northern limit of the white crown's population and looking at how their stress response differs from, say, a bird down here on traditional range. It's too early to say for sure that this is indeed a range expansion, but white crowns are a newcomer to the Arctic. Laplands are Arctic specialists. They had done some pretty detailed bird surveys, I think, in the early 2000s. White crowns, the furthest north they had found them was basically around Happy Valley, mile post 334 on the Dalton Highway. Last year we did another survey and found two birds up at 396. Is it colonizer phenotypes, colonizer behavior? Is it because they're being pushed out of southern areas? They're inferior birds that are being pushed out? What, what is driving this range expansion, really? And one thing that we found is that they do tend to have a higher stress response on the northern limit of a population's range. And part of that could be due to just harsher climates or the habitat isn't as good. It's not that far to Dead Horse. They're not quite shrubs that far, at least not accessible from the road. They're getting there. I and mean, if the shrubs get all the way to Dead Horse and expand, they could quite possibly be white crowns up there in the future.